So, let's talk about Raymond. Raymond is a short gray cat in a waistcoat with black ears and one blonde wisp of hair that swoops across his forehead. He has black paws and a black tail and has complete heterochromia. One of his eyes is green and the other is brown. Raymond wears big black plastic frame glasses and his catchphrase is crisp. He often talks of stardom and wanting to be famous. His house is dressed like a CEO suite with office themed furniture and the music that plays in it is the ever popular KK Cruisin. Now I'm sure you've heard a lot about Raymond recently, as he's all over the feeds. Raymond is an incredibly popular villager, perhaps more popular than any villager ever in the history of Animal Crossing. You might think that he plays a large role in the game if you've never touched New Horizons yourself, but in fact most players who love him have never met him either. He's one of the very few villagers in the game that does not have an associated amiibo card allowing him to be handpicked by the player as a resident. Instead, it's entirely left up to chance that he appears in the player's campsite, or on a mystery island, making the opportunity to meet him and invite him to move into the player's town quite rare. Raymond's unique appearance, combined with his inherent rarity, has made him quite coveted among New Horizons players. We'll come back to Raymond in a moment, though. First, I want to introduce you to a villager you maybe haven't heard of at all. This is Butch, the brown dog. The first thing you need to know about Butch is that he loves fossils. Like most dogs, digging up bones and chewing them is his favorite way to pass the time. He maybe wants to settle down and get married and have kids someday, but you know what, right now all he wants is to have the most impressive collection of fossils you've ever seen. More impressive even than Blathers. The second thing you should know about Butch is that he f***ing hates degenerates who care about a name things like personality quizzes, and if you give him a yodel shirt he'll slash your tires and burn your house down. Butch has a soft spot, though, for his main squeeze, Goldie. Something about Goldie's sweet, unassuming demeanor and gentle ways just calms this high-strung pup right down. Butch might not be aesthetically very interesting to look at, but he's got a story. He's got likes and dislikes. He'll kick your f***ing ass if you waste his time. But deep down, he's got a heart of gold. You just have to really get to know him to ever see his softer side. Butch has been in Animal Crossing games from the very beginning, and most players have the opportunity to have him in their towns, as his amiibo card was featured in Series 2 packs and currently sells for about $10 online, give or take. If you have $10 to spare, at any point the chance to befriend this toughy and get to break down his layers could be yours. But the sad thing is, not only do most players not really care about getting to know Butch and villagers like him, he doesn't seem to care about any of those things anymore either. Butch is older now, his ambitious youth gone and drained away. He doesn't have it in him to kick anyone's ass or turn down a single yodel shirt. He won't even ask you for fossils anymore. Butch will just passively smile at anything you give him and then go on about his day without a single thought in his head, anything he wants to do, or anything to say. Butch is now a lot like Raymond, where the most you can say about him is describe his appearance. And the fact that his appearance was originally the least interesting thing about him makes him pretty undesirable to most people now. Villagers have been in a slow decline for a long time now. Once one of the bigger parts of gameplay, having distinct vibrant personalities, strong traits, and values like hating yodel shirts, villagers are now more or less another commodity for players to collect and display in their towns like statues. In the past, villagers wouldn't passively praise the player from the background, but rather actively antagonize them. The contrast between villagers who were kind and villagers who were mean made the relationship between the player and the villager the deciding factor between who was coveted and who was shunned, rather than superficial factors like the villager's appearance or species. Players used to have a real reason not to want certain villagers around as much as others, based on how that villager behaved and their general decorum. But today, it's turned into a mere beauty contest, where all villagers are valued not on their character, but instead their aesthetics. So what happened? The short answer is teenagers. The long answer is the role of villagers in Animal Crossing games have changed over time throughout each title, and ultimately these changes have led to a general commodification of villagers, where rather than real dynamic characters, they feel more like static objects, and players treat them as such. I think there's a number of reasons for this, not only due to an increased focus on aesthetics over time, but also several other factors. So today I'd like to explore how these specific dynamics have changed over time in each title, and how that's impacted the role of villagers in the Animal Crossing series. My hypothesis is that the relationship between the player and villagers is informed by a few specific variables throughout the games. Namely, number one, what is the main role of villagers in each game? What are their systems and how do they interact with others in the town? What mechanics exist to facilitate or incentivize interaction? What do you get out of interacting and how often can you interact? Number two, the pace of the game. How quickly slash slowly the player can accomplish tasks, obtain items and bells, how long it takes to finish your dailies, and the length of a typical play session. This will change whether the villagers themselves are necessary for accomplishing these things as a primary or secondary function. And number three, the influence of the player on the environment. How much control does the player have over the town? How much impact do you have versus the others that live there? What's the balance of power here? How incentivized are you to engage with expressive elements in the game, and where does that incentive come from? 
To get to the bottom of what the value of each villager is in the town, the role that they play, and the relationship with the player, we must explore each of these dynamics. If the player has to work harder for basic things, the villagers become valuable resources. If the player has significantly more agency than the villagers, this will change the balance of power in the town. If the systems that the villager has to interact with the townies change from game to game, so will the incentives and means to interact. Looking at every single Animal Crossing game released outside of Japan is a big task for one video, so let's not waste any more time and get right into it. But first, ad break! Really quickly, I just wanted to make this video even longer by announcing that I'm launching a campaign with Makeshift to make a limited edition Vaporwave Tama plush. If you've been watching me for a while, you know that having a plush made of my own avatar is like a dream come true for me, and I'm so excited about having a plush of little old me out there in the world. This cute little 8-inch softie is based on my popular Vaporwave shirt design, featuring the awesome avatar art by Justin Lee. Now it's in 3D! Ta-da! The way the campaign works is that the plush is only produced once a certain number of pre-orders are made. If we hit our pre-order goal within three weeks of this announcement, the plush is produced and shipped to everyone who orders one. If the pre-order goal is not met, the plush is not produced, and everyone gets their money back. So no worries, no stress, you just buy one if you want one, and if enough people buy one, it'll be shipped to you within 50 days of the end of the campaign. And if not, everyone gets 100% of their money refunded. This high quality, very cute, sitting Tama buddy with meme hat costs $24.99, with a flat $7.50 international shipping fee. Click the link below the video to learn more and snag one for yourself. And now, back to Animal Crossing. Part 1. Systems. Villagers have been around from the very beginning, of course, first appearing in population growing. In this game, villagers have a unique system of interaction not duplicated in any later game that makes them a pretty constant source of content and resources. The relationship between the player and villagers here is one of mutually beneficial exchange of goods and services. At any time, the player can talk to villagers about the town and ask them if they need a favor done as one of the dialogue choices. These favors come mostly in the form of fetch quests. Go get my watch from Ali, oh sorry I lent it to Bob thinking it was mine, here's that watch, go give it to Static, so on and so forth. Once completed, they'll reward you for your time with any number of valuable resources. This means you have a lot of incentive to spend a lot of time running all over the place talking to various neighbors, trying to get to the next target in a game of hot potato. The more you talk to them and do errands for them, the more you get to know them and the wider variety of tasks they'll have for you to do. Some will ask you to plant them flowers, some will ask you to bring them a ball to kick around, some will ask for a bug or a fish or a piece of fruit, and some just want you to write them letters because they're lonely. This breaks up the gameplay nicely and keeps it from becoming really monotonous, although you can always offer to help them out, the way the errands are framed doesn't make it feel like they don't have agency of their own. Just that out of convenience, it would be nice if you did. You scratch their backs, they scratch yours. Basically, they tend to feel like real people, if not somewhat cold and distant ones. They have whims, they have wants of their own, they have something to offer you if you have something to offer them. The power dynamic almost places you at the bottom when the game starts out, since you have to rely on them for resources and they don't give anything away for free. You can also just shoot the breeze and sometimes they'll have something to say about what's going on in town that week, or sometimes they'll make you a trade offer for something in your inventory or offer to sell you something that they have. They have really distinct personalities. Some of them are happy to see you, some of them couldn't care less that you're around or actively dislike you. You can make them happy by completing favors successfully and writing them a lot, or you can piss them off by by talking to them too much in a row, failing to do a task correctly within the frame of a day, or bullying them by hitting them with nets and pushing them around. If you hurt their feelings, they'll become temporarily mad at you and ignore you for a while, and you'll have to apologize or do something to make it up to them. Villagers can even ask you to get an item back from someone who's already asleep, basically guaranteeing that they'll be angry at you the next day if you don't remember to finish the errand first thing. The interaction is more or less one way. They won't come up to you to talk, and they don't have long conversations with other villagers that you can listen in on, but you can basically always find someone with something for you to do for them. This is also probably the most sassy villagers have ever been in the entire series, as even when you do nice things for them, they'll usually dole out backhanded compliments, or can just be straight up rude to your face for no reason. The particularly nasty personalities of cranky and snooty villagers are on one end of the spectrum, with the kind of snarky, peppy, and lazy in the middle of the rudeness gradient, and normal and jock more on the nice side. There's a pretty big contrast between each personality type, and it makes you appreciate the rare moments of kindness from a cranky, or the reproof of civility from a nice chat with a normal villager. You can have up to 15 villagers in a town, since your forest is really huge, and it tends to feel like a big bustling community when you have people building multiple houses on a single acre. Though not complicated, these systems provide a nice feeling of community and a nice variety of interactions, even if your interfacing options are limited. Wild World mixes the favor system entirely, which shifts the weight on villager interactions away from the material rewards you might get from them. Instead, the focal point is the content of interactions themselves, and a new friendship system that was based on the quality of your interactions. The map was smaller on the DS than it was on the GameCube, which meant that everyone lived a lot closer together and mingled with one another a lot more often. 
villagers were constantly moving around and crossing paths. And finally, they can actually have full-on conversations with one another that you could participate in. From these conversations, you learn that each individual has a unique relationship with one another. Some get along, some totally clash, some flirt with one another, some gossip about one another. Relationships between villagers created a new kind of emergent storytelling, the complex web of connections between the animals who make up your town. Who was getting along with who, love triangles, one-sided friendships, all unfolding in each conversation. Occasionally, villagers would quiz you on whether or not you understood the relationship with another villager, incentivizing the player to try to learn and notice these things about each neighbor's relationship with other neighbors. Additionally, rather than the player being the only one able to initiate an interaction, villagers would now ping the player on a 15-minute timer and engage with them in conversation or get mad if you didn't respond. These timers were based on the individual villager's last interaction with the player, not a single timer for the whole town as later games implemented, which meant that multiple villagers could ping the player in a row or even all at once. The high volume of pings makes up somewhat for not being able to ask the villagers directly for tasks to do. Every few minutes, at least one villager will ping you with something that they want to say or do, meaning you'll never be wandering around with no one talking to you for very long. Also replacing favors, villagers now have unique hobbies that they cycle through. Some collect fossils, some collect clothes, some want to fish or catch bugs, some want to redecorate their home. This makes the tasks you get from one villager vary from another and makes each interaction distinct. Not only do they have their set personalities, peppy, cranky, jock, and so on, but they also have interests, likes and dislikes to learn about and get involved in. And the more you participate in their lives by learning about them and their interests and their relationships, the more you're rewarded by a noticeable change in your own relationship to the villager. Villagers became warmer, more giving, more open with you. And this was the main reason to keep checking in every day, to find that rare fossil for Butch or catch that bee for Blue Bear once the sun came up, to see what new things your villagers would be up to and see your relationship with them grow over time. This system changed the dynamic between the player and their neighbors. Rather than trading goods or favors, the game emulates the arc of a friendship, and that's its own reward for the interaction. It's a mutually beneficial relationship between the player and villagers based on meeting social needs, not material goods. You have to put an effort to become friends, as it was easy to accidentally do something that might lower friendship, like sending a letter with a typo in it, or accidentally pushing them while running around town. Now you are graded on how often you succeeded and won the villager's affection, and how often you failed and hurt a villager's feelings. The friendship system in this game also heavily weighted letter writing, highly encouraging the player to go out of their way to correspond often. Getting to know each villager, learning their hobbies, sending them mail, and building a relationship would result in different friendlier dialogue. And if you got to know them well enough, you'd even be gifted a photo of them to keep in your house. And they put a lot of effort into making each villager feel like an individual worth getting to know. You're not likely to have two villagers with the same personality and hobby in your town at the same time. And you can talk to the same villager over and over again and not run into a lot of repeating dialogue, though you will piss them off. A peppy villager interested in bugs is going to have a different flavor than a pep interested in catching fish. If you keep playing long enough, hobbies do cycle and it's possible to get everyone in the town hooked on fossils at the same time, but I'd be lying if I said that in itself isn't an interesting emergent story that makes the town feel lived in and real. It's the story of that one time your whole village got hooked on a fossil craze. The thing that Wild World managed to do successfully more than any other game in the franchise is make villagers feel alive. Like not only do they have agency and depth, likes and dislikes, wants and goals, dreams and aspirations, but they also have the potential to become dear friends to the player. Hell, even the NPCs this time around all have a unique story to uncover the more you play and diligently put in the time to get to know them. Nook, Blathers, Brewster, and of course Sable and Mabel will all open up to you and share things about themselves when you put in the time. But you're not directed to do so. You just have to find the benefit in getting to know them to be worth pursuing for its own sake. The value in each villager and inhabitant of the town lies not in how cute they are or in what their house looks like or in their singular function as an NPC, but in their friendship and company. This makes them feel, more than any other game, like real people. Their value is who they are, not what they give you. Before I start talking about City Folk, I'd like to offer a quick disclaimer. City Folk is the Animal Crossing game I've spent the least time with. So I don't know everything that there is to know about how villagers interact in this game compared to others. Unfortunately, Animal Crossing is the kind of game you have to really commit to spending at least a month with to kind of figure out this deeper system stuff beyond surface level. And for many reasons, I was not able to give it that time this month. Additionally, strangely, a lot of information about City Folk Online is either incomplete or contradictory, possibly due to the game being released in 2008 when the Nintendo community online was just starting to grow and most participants were kids. Researching it was a nightmare. I would find a lot of sources that would say things like, it's just like Wild World in every single way, and then get into the game myself and find out immediately that that's not true at all. So please take what I say here with a grain of salt. Some of the things I think might have been brand new to New Leaf, for example, might have been introduced in City Folk instead, 
and I just didn't run into it myself, and I might not have some of the nuance of the systems down the way I should. I might come back to City Folk at some point and just do a full video on it alone once I've had more time to spend with it, since it really is a strange and interesting game in a why are you the way that you are kind of way. But for now, I'll have to settle for having incomplete knowledge, and you can correct me in the comments if I've gotten something wrong here. So from what I've been able to gather from my short time with City Folk, hobbies are in this game, maybe? The biggest reason that it's hard to tell is that they've introduced a new bizarre dialogue system here based on subject trees that really blurs the lines between what's a tree and what's a hobby. Villagers will get to talking about a subject, and if you continue to talk to them repeatedly, all subsequent dialogue will be about the same subject. So sometimes this seems like hobby-related dialogue. They might say a bunch of stuff in a row about bugs and then ask you to find them a bug. This in addition to some villagers having a higher likelihood to talk about some topics that are related to things in their house makes me think that this is the hobby system watered down until it's nearly unrecognizable. If it is the hobby system, they change hobbies very frequently and at random. But sometimes they'll pick a random subject like holidays and just keep talking about that until they've exhausted their dialogue tree. Once they do, the villager will just repeat the very last item in the tree until you stop talking to them. Most of these trees are very short, two interactions worth each, which results in pretty quickly ending up with a broken record villager that you can't interact with further, and some of them are longer, but that's pretty rare. The strange thing about the system is that it discourages you from talking to a villager multiple times in a row, and at the same time, it often means that if you're looking for a request or a task from a villager, you'll have to talk to them multiple times in a row until they reach the point in their tree where they land on it. The ping timer was also altered so that it was one ping for the whole town per three to five minutes. Since it was now limited to one ping at a time, even on a shorter timer, the outcome was fewer interactions with villagers overall. And since it was kind of a crapshoot talking to them normally, they much less often wanted anything to do with you or had anything to offer you in terms of content. Some new types of interactions were added, such as playing hide and seek and weekly events like villagers losing their keys or needing messages delivered, and some holdovers from Wild World persisted, such as the friendship system, villager gossip, and distinct personalities, but your town and city folk is much bigger than towns in Wild World, meaning that villagers are much less likely to cross paths and interact with one another, and in general, the villager interactions in this game are extremely toned down, to the point where it feels like you're actively discouraged from talking to them. This sets it apart from Wild World in a big way. New Leaf continued this trend to the point that villagers are downright depressing to interact with. The stock personalities, peppy, cranky, and so on were ironed out and made blander to the point where they were virtually indistinguishable from one another, even with two new personality types added, Uchi and Smug. Hobbies were also completely removed at this point, and with nothing to replace them, there was nothing to differentiate one peppy villager from another peppy, nothing to make any of their interactions unique or distinct. Each member of your community became completely interchangeable in terms of the types of things that they say and the types of tasks associated with their interactions. The ping timer here is unchanged from city folk, but the tree system is gone, meaning talking to them normally by instigating a conversation was much less of a random mess, and you can actually have normal interactions again. However, the dialogue itself was so lackluster that you weren't likely to want to talk to them much, and you were still pretty likely to get repeating phrases just due to the lack of unique dialogue in this game. Additionally, most requests for tasks were relegated to pings, meaning that you couldn't just talk to them if you were looking for something to do, they had to talk to you, and you would basically only interact with them at all once every 10 minutes at best. More new types of interactions were added, such as requests for petitions you had to get signatures for in a friend's town, and the individual friendship system remained, but the incentive to become friends with these cardboard cutout mannequins did not. There were no stakes because villagers would no longer be hurt or upset if you did something wrong, and they had no personalities or likes or dislikes to learn. You just did the same sorts of things for everyone pretty infrequently, and they all responded the same way to everything you did. The dynamic was totally lost. I think New Horizons attempted to remedy this, as the game actually has a pretty complex friendship system discovered through data mining that obviously someone had to put a lot of thought and time into, but the way it's implemented makes it feel like actually it just wasn't playtested enough, and there was some kind of massive oversight. Essentially, although interactions with villagers are possible in New Horizons, the way the friendship system is designed kind of dummies them out of the game in a way that feels like an accident. You see, in this game, the different types of interactions that you can have with villagers beyond normal conversations are tied to a table directly based on your friendship level with them, which is based on points earned by talking to them once a day, giving them gifts once a day, the quality of gifts, whether it's gift wrapped, and so on. This seems to be an attempt to add depth and incentive to your relationship with a villager, as they'll warm up to you the more you talk to them, and will want to do a wider variety of things with you. However, if you reach a new level of friendship, the game will prioritize higher level interactions. And since tasks like catching them fish and bugs, or playing games with them are a lower level interaction than trading items and receiving gifts from them, after a while they basically only want to talk to you about items and nothing else. 
This means that although villagers can direct gameplay by asking you for favors or games the way they used to be able to, if you become closer friends with them, they stop doing that entirely and will start treating you like a mobile pawn shop instead. It's also virtually impossible to lose friendship points with a villager now without going out of your way to do so, since letter writing was entirely removed from the friendship equation, and you can't irritate them on accident by failing to do a task or talking to them too often. With points being so easy to earn and so difficult to lose, the complexities of this friendship system are pretty lost in the outcome. It doesn't feel like an arc so much, as villagers more or less just become broken down animatronics over time that lost most of their initial functionality. Villagers do in fact have likes in this game, maybe not so much dislikes, they do have preferred styles of clothing and colors that they like to wear over others, and you'll get more friendship points by giving them their preferred gift than giving them something outside these categories. However, ultimately you're rewarded more for ignoring this altogether and just giving them any piece of furniture instead, so it seems like kind of a waste to have these neat complexities built in and then make them irrelevant. The fact that almost all of your interactions with this game revolve around giving them stuff once a day also makes it feel like a one-sided friendship based on material goods. Villagers will in fact give out friendship points for the birthday presents you give them based on their monetary value above all other factors. They have a little inventory database in their brains of every item in the game sorted by highest value first, and will grade you based on how much you spend on them. It's a weird system that actually makes them feel more shallow rather than more fleshed out despite the complexities. The other big missed opportunity here is dialogue. Villagers do in fact have kind of a wide range of things they can say in this game. However, the game once again heavily weighs one set of dialogue options over another, making it far more likely for villagers to talk about a couple specific things over and over and that you'll get a lot of repeating dialogue. It's possible that this is some kind of variation of the tree system, as almost everyone in town will want to talk about the same thing at the same time. It's kind of bizarre. If you talk to them, 9 times out of 10 they'll comment on the player's activity in the town or another player who came to visit. If you do nothing all day, dig up zero fossils, have no visitors from other towns for several days, they do in fact have other things they can say, but if you play the game at all, do anything in your town or have anyone visit, ever, they become little diaries of the things that happen in your town and have no personalities or wants or needs of their own. They just recount to you events which you were present for as if you have the memory of a goldfish, ad nauseum. They feel essentially like little vacuums of personality that say nothing interesting and only exist as cute little props to sing and act cute and look at the stuff you build, so you can get a nice little video to post on social media about how cute your animals are when they do the cute empty stuff they do. Hilariously, they actually refer to the random pantomimes villagers do around town as this game's hobby system, but it has nothing in common with previous hobbies. It simply makes certain villagers more likely to read over others, some more likely to run around, and so on and so forth. Adding to this empty broken feeling, the ping system was so heavily altered that villagers will only ping you once a day to once a week. So over time as you play more and more of the game, they stop having tasks for you to do, stop having having interesting things to say to you, and stop wanting to talk to you basically ever. It kind of seems like their system backfired and has the complete opposite effect in practice that they intended on paper. The more time you spend with them, the less they want anything to do with you. Part 2. Pacing The pace of population growing is much slower than any of the games that came after it. Quality of life? Don't know her. In this game, we mail fossils to the faraway museum and they come back three days later and then you can donate them. In this game, fishing is difficult and you have a lot less of a guarantee that you'll be able to get something at all when you cast your line. In this game, Nook's Cranny carries a single furniture item a day and a single tool a day, making getting started really hard, and the handful of expansions only add one piece of furniture sold each upgrade. In this game, we mail letters one at a time, and we don't even send them out until there's a full bag of mail ready to be delivered. There's an event or a special character visiting a couple times a week, not once a day. Life just moves slower. To make progress in this game, you really are required to make a somewhat significant daily contribution of time. Even the act of needing to sit down and boot up your GameCube and dedicate nearly an entire memory card's worth of space to the game grounds you and makes the time you spend with the game an investment. Essentially, in a GameCube game, the catalog is smaller, there's only 40 fish and bugs to catch all year, and way fewer fossils and works of art. But you have to put in much more work to acquire each one. Getting any of the rare items or fish is an enormous task requiring a lot of grinding. I've been playing in my town every day for a month and I still don't have a bed for my house because there are so few daily opportunities to get new furniture. 
This makes villagers a really necessary resource, since they're one of the only ways to get access to new stuff throughout the game through favors. Villagers can give you rare fruits that don't grow in your town, furniture, walls, flooring, stationery, ugh, or even paintings if you're really lucky. As a result of there being so few ways to expand your catalog, the grind of running errands for villagers is built into the core gameplay loop here. I've been calling this game a grind, but much like Pokemon Gold and Silver, the investment of work you put into everything makes the fruits of your labor feel much more like rewards, and taking the time to run around your town each day, slowly accomplishing your own goals, is both constantly stimulating and gratifying. It's a relaxed game, but you're much less likely to run out of stuff to do in a session even with fewer overall features than later games. And the fact that villagers are such a big part of all this means that you're going to be spending a lot of time with them, talking to them, and looking for them in your massive 42-acre forest. And as a result, each villager is a major player in your daily life. Wild World is where many of the main gameplay staples that have stuck around for the majority of the titles were introduced. The core gameplay remains, you still have the same house to pay off, and the same means to fill it and fill your museum as before, but many quality of life improvements were made. Blathers could now identify fossils himself instantly, and the touchscreen allowed for much easier, faster inventory management and letter mailing. This also picked up the pace of the game slightly, which changed the flow of gameplay. Rather than putting in a lot of time to work towards long-term goals in one sitting, Wild World has more pick up and play type sessions, where you carry the game with you on your handheld throughout your day and check in whenever you have a spare moment. Things like earning bells and upgrading nooks seem to happen much more quickly. Even the base nooks cranny store carries two items of furniture a day and two tools a day rather than just one. And it's not so difficult to swiftly put together a furnished and decent looking house and get to hunting for fish and bugs and filling out your museum. The game requires less time to be invested to make progress and puts less emphasis on grinding out chores to get your hands on one or two extra pieces of furniture a day from villagers. There are still weekly events that come and go to look forward to and plan around for truly special and unique rewards and experiences, but the base basics of daily life come much more easily. Instead, most of your time spent in Wild World is just kind of hanging out and enjoying the emergent gameplay that came from the new villager systems. Villagers having hobbies became the primary motivation for expanding the catalog. You'd be directed to do things for them like find a new shirt or catch a new fish, and that would help guide what activities would be the focus for that play session. If Peewee wants a sea bass, for example, and for some reason you've never caught one, you'll be motivated to grind out the shore to fill out your encyclopedia until you finally find that stinker for him. One of the main reasons expanding the catalog catalog became less difficult is, for some reason, villagers will throw out one or two pieces of furniture from their homes a day until they're nearly empty, perhaps to incentivize the player to send them more furniture and letters, which means that you can pretty quickly get a matching set of furniture right out of the recycling bin right out of the gate, including basics like beds and cabinets. Storage is majorly increased to compensate, as in the GameCube game, a cabinet would only hold three items at a time. Here you can save entire sets of furniture easily without needing to be choosy about what you hold onto and what you sell. Villagers will also now always send you a present in the mail if you write them and attach an item, no matter what you send, which makes them veritable fountains of items like clothes, wallpaper, furniture, and even fruit. So they are still a resource, but they're so often teeming with stuff to give you without needing to put in much effort at all that you don't actually need to work it into your daily grind. They just end up showering you with stuff at every turn. City Folk was created primarily to market the online features of the Wii. We speak in Wii Connect 24, and it seems to be kind of hastily thrown together otherwise with most of the content and assets lifted directly from Wild World, and the game encourages you to import your character and catalog from Wild World itself and keep playing the same file more or less. Although online play was introduced with Wild World, the technology was in its infancy at the time, and the community for it didn't explode overnight. A stable Wi-Fi connection wasn't a common thing in the majority of homes around the world yet. Gradually, more and more people adopted it, and it felt like a small little club of enthusiasts. With a lack of social media to coincide with these features, the community was safely pocketed away on dedicated forums, and you weren't likely to have more than one or two close friends who would also play the game. With this in mind, most of the new features added in City Folk really pushed for expanding online play to support the new features of the Wii they were trying to plug. The first time you head to the city, Rover sits you down to talk your ear off about Wii Connect 24. This was essentially the same online system as Wild World, except instead of being able to trade villagers and send mail only when you were in another person's town, now you could do it pretty much whenever your Wii was connected to the internet. In fact, it's very difficult to get started in City Folk without access to the internet or your Wild World catalog. You can go to the city immediately, and everything there costs a lot of bells. Unlocking Red Shop alone costs 3,000 bells, getting a haircut costs another 3,000, getting your shoes shined is 500, and going to see Dr. Shrunk's theater is another 800 a day. It might take you all day to make enough to do everything without access to different kinds of fruit in other people's towns to sell, or big bell trading at the auction house or the stock market. 
You basically just have to waste a lot of time catching red snappers all day to make any money in any season that isn't the summer. Unlike Wild World, where villagers shower you with gifts in the mail and are constantly offering you tasks to earn more bells and furniture, and are also constantly throwing their own furniture away for you to snag out of the recycling bin, in this game, villagers aren't at all a constant source of anything thanks to the new broken record dialogue system, and are much more likely to ask you to sacrifice something expensive to give to them instead of selling it to make the bells you so desperately need. The control scheme itself discourages writing a lot of letters to villagers in order to get them to send presents back to you in the mail, unless you haul out a USB keyboard to speed up the process, and the rate at which they trash their own stuff for you to take is greatly diminished. Between the museum, my villagers, and the city, I'm being pulled immediately in three directions at once. Lots of expensive clothing, services, and furniture are available to me, but I'm always broke if I prioritize completing content over earning expressive elements. Though the game placed heavy emphasis on the online stuff, and some new expressive elements may have shifted the game slightly more in the direction of aesthetic blogs than past games, the online community for city folk didn't have significantly more activity than Wild World, and the small pockets of dedicated players online and small community feel remained. The Wii, of course, didn't have quite the control scheme or interface to facilitate quick in-game typing without the use of dedicated peripherals, and Wii Speak was not super popular or reliable. The quality of a Wii Speak headset was the same as the in-game chat feature found in DS Pokemon games, which is to say, not great. So despite their best efforts, City Folk did not significantly expand the online player base, and a lot of people just kept playing Wild World in lieu of making the jump to the Wii. An attempt was made to heavily integrate online play and incentivize players to use it, but the response to this game was lukewarm making the bulk of the gameplay fall back on the weaker, less villager-centric single-player stuff. Considering the dialogue system actively discourages players from talking to the villagers enough to actually get tasks from them, this made it less likely that the player would be offered guidance for their play during a session, and with very little to offer the player otherwise, villagers sort of faded into the background. New Leaf, on the other hand, was released in 2013, in an era where Wi-Fi was in most every home around the world, and smartphones had thoroughly revolutionized the internet and social media access. As a result, this time playing online, with other players, and using the expressive elements to compete for the most aesthetically pleasing town became the focus of the game, and was much more successfully built into the gameplay loop. The average player was encouraged to take advantage of resources online, to play the stock market, and quickly amass large quantities of bells and rare items, rather than spend a lot of time slowly grinding it out the hard way in single player through favors to villagers, or waiting to see what the shop had each day. Public works projects costing money continued to make having a lot of bells a bigger part of the game. Beyond paying off your house, your town required constant cash flow to continue to build it up, which meant grinding a lot of beetles on the island year-round in order to make enough bells to invest in turnips and flip a profit online. But thanks to the huge increase in online support from the community, this time this was actually a viable way to play, and the online economy was an actual necessary and accessible resource. Dream Suites gave players a way to showcase their towns to the world perfectly preserved in time. The Happy Home Showcase meant you could show off your mansion to anyone you passed on campus or riding the bus. Island tours provided structured activities for you and your friends completely removed from your life with your villagers. Much of the core gameplay of New Leaf is built on the curation of expressive elements, and using those elements in online play, much like a social media profile. This very greatly diminished the importance of villagers as a resource for the player. They added two new sets of furniture that could only be obtained from villagers' inventories, the sloppy and cardboard sets, but after a certain amount of time the game had been out, the online marketplace became a much more reliable way to obtain these as well. Through retail, villagers could now directly trade items with the player, but there was less incentive to use those means of getting furniture rather than trading with real-life people. The only actual way villagers feed into this new gameplay loop at all is that their suggestions are how public works projects are unlocked. But this happens on a timer rather than through deliberate interaction, and certain sets are locked to certain personality types. Uchi villagers are the only ones that can suggest a wisteria trellis, for example, or lazy villagers are the only ones that can suggest a hammock. This gave players an incentive to have a wider variety of personality types in their town, but otherwise the random nature of these suggestions and the fact that the villagers don't react to whether or not you actually follow through and build them makes it feel somewhat arbitrary. Additionally, with hobbies removed, villagers had a further reduced impact on the gameplay loop. New Horizons does return to form somewhat in terms of pacing. It has many things in common with New Leaf, including a focus on aesthetics and an emphasis on online play, but it takes some things in a new direction and shakes up the gameplay loop. Thanks to a brand new, much smaller pool of items available in the game, and the fact that a majority of items must be handcrafted by the player through DIY recipes, filling out the catalog is once again a major part of the core gameplay and requires an investment of time. There's a separate section of items and furniture that can only be purchased, and Nook's only upgrades based on some pretty strict time requirements. A good chunk of furniture is ridiculously expensive now to compensate for players making bonkers money in the online economy, and most of the catalog is entirely unavailable until the first upgrade happens. 
Oddly, though the player has the ability to recolor most any crafted item through refurbishment, different colors of purchase furniture are locked to the player. One player will only get the white rattan set in the shop and not be able to change its color, and another will only get the brown one. So trading online with other players is once again a major focus of the game, especially since opportunities for new DIY recipes are limited to a few a day, and there's a gotcha-like rarity table, making repeats of common recipes extremely likely. Another money sink is infrastructure, as inclines and bridges cost an entire mortgage worth of bells to pay off, and with few means to grind bells in the single player, buying and selling turnips is now basically mandatory. The Encyclopedia of Bugs and Fish is greatly expanded to a total of 80 each, and with tools now breakable and the need to dig up clams and craft bait to get some of the rarer or more location-specific fish to spawn, crafting items itself becomes the main grind of the game. The quality of life and ease of access in menus and getting things done like evaluating fossils is about where you'd expect it to be at this point in the series, but strangely there are some odd things about the design that slow things down in a way that doesn't feel necessarily intentional. Wilbur's Wi-Fi menu being ridiculously time-consuming, for example, I think is something that they just didn't give enough thought to, while not being able to craft multiples of the same item at once I think is deliberate. New Horizons is also the most linear Animal Crossing game yet, with customization options unlocked by completing a story mode that spans a few weeks of gameplay which railroads the player into caring about the town rating, something that has always been an optional goal in past games. Villagers are one of the only consistent sources of DIY recipes, which makes them valuable to the player in that regard, and provide another way to play cooperatively online through sharing that resource with friends. At any given time throughout the day, at least one villager in every town will be crafting something, and they'll share that recipe with the player and any visiting players. It's not uncommon for your Discord servers to be buzzing with activity over who's crafting what and sharing dodo codes for access to that rare DIY. However, beyond that point, the new villager interaction systems locking bartering behind a friendship level means that early on they are much less likely to be a source of new items to the player. In fact, the way villager interactions are built into this game makes it almost impossible to get items from them on a regular basis. As a result, villagers are not much help to you outside of providing one more chance to roll that die for a new DIY recipe each session. If they're not inside their houses crafting, they're not really contributing anything to your playtime. Since DIY recipes aren't tied to personality or species, or anything specific about the villager, their roles in the town are more or less interchangeable. This means that the only major way villagers influence the gameplay loop is being a Another aesthetic element to manipulate through gotcha grinding. Part 3. Power or Agency The expressive elements in GameCube Crossing are light, and there's not a lot that the player can do to influence the environment. You have nearly equal power to impact the forest as any one of the other animals that live in your town. That is to say, basically none at all. You can plant trees and flowers, which villagers can't, but the forest doesn't give players a lot of say in where things grow in. There are only a certain number of viable spots for trees to grow in each acre, meaning you can't just plant trees in neat little rows and expect it to just work out. Instead, there are dead zones all over that are impossible to detect without just experimenting and seeing what wilts and what doesn't. Nature is in charge here, bitch. You can finally get that rare fruit and plant it in the middle of an open field and the forest can say nah and kill it before it sprouts. Flowers exist, but barely. You start with zero flowers in your town, and they're only purchasable from Nook in whatever quantity he has available every day. They're not able to be picked up and replanted once they're put down, so they're not easy to rearrange if you happen to change your mind later. They're also very fragile, and there's no watering can and no hybrids. It takes a long time to fill your forest with flowers. Although villagers will not plant flowers of their own in this game, they will often request that the player plant them a garden through the favor system, which incentivizes the player to plant the few flowers available each day where their neighbors want them. The customization options are also pretty shallow. You can design patterns, but only eight of them, and they can only be used on your entire outfit or umbrella, wallpaper or flooring, save for the occasional signpost. With furniture being hard to get and storage extremely limited, it'll take a long time and a lot of hard work to make the few items you do get look decent. This isn't a fashion show. It's not about having the most impressive house or town or the best looking clothes. The goals of population growing are more about providing a life simulation game where you slowly make progress in various areas over time than providing the player with a lot of power and freedom to express themselves. Both elements are present, but one clearly takes precedence over the other. It's not your town, it's a town you share with the others who inhabit it. Some things and spaces are yours, and you can within certain limits make them say something about you, but most of the spaces are shared by the community of the forest. Certainly if you don't come to play, your absence is felt. There's a feeling of neglect that comes with weed growth. So you do add something of value to the community by living there and participating. 
but you're merely maintaining this space, not owning it. The expressive elements are merely a reward for participation, not the sole focus of gameplay. Although the means through which villagers can express their agency are limited, the game still does a pretty good job of making them feel like active participants in town life. Through the items they have you ferry around town for them, it becomes clear that they have lives together watching videotapes, playing Game Boys, reading books, all without you. You're external to their ecosystem in a lot of ways. You have absolutely zero say in whether a villager moves in or out of your town and where they put their house. If someone moves out, they give you no warning, and one day they'll just be gone and the only notice you get is a letter in your mailbox. Sometimes the villagers will leave their own messages on the board near your house about how they hid a piece of furniture somewhere or they planted a pitfall seed. Sometimes they'll take it upon themselves to repaint your roof without asking you. Sometimes if you talk to them with a rare item in your inventory, they'll take it from you without your consent. These guys are wily and willful, and their presence is noticeable and impactful. Wild World is where we start to see this dynamic shift just a little. The player now has a lot more control over the landscape because the process of planting trees became more clear and transparent. Rather than undetectable dead zones, trees simply could not be planted in any area where they did not have one entire free space in every direction. Flowers also now could wilt, be picked up and moved, as well as watered and bred to produce new flowers and hybrids. In addition to the new option of laying custom patterns on the ground, this freedom created the possibility for the layout of the town to be another moldable, expressive element for the player. Granted, this was still somewhat shallow, as the palettes for creating paths and patterns were extremely limited compared to later games, and it was difficult and tedious to lay them out in a way that looked even remotely decent. The limited pattern slots also meant that you might need to make additional characters just to hold things like corner pieces if you wanted your paths to be more complex. And the diversity of the grounds and different colors and shapes of grass at different times of the year made faux transparency really hard to accomplish. And with few ways to share patterns with other players built into the game other than filling up your mannequins at the store, some degree of artistic ability or ingenuity from the community was required to do anything really impressive with your layout. But nevertheless, there was a noticeable boon to expressive features in this game. Rather than having things be hard to get to begin with, the goal here was creating an impressive combination of things to show off to your friends and aid in character building. A wider variety of house options, expansions, and clothing were introduced. But as the player's ability to impact the landscape expanded, so did the villagers to a degree. Villagers could now plant their own flowers and water them too, and were especially likely to do so if gardening happened to be their hobby. They also still picked their own home locations, and there were no restrictions on what they could and couldn't move in on top of. You could spend a lot of time planting flowers and growing hybrids, laying perfect paths, but if any of those happened to be too close to a signpost and a villager moved in, they would be straight up deleted and removed to make room. Villagers could still move in and out without any input from you, and were more likely to move if they were in between hobbies. But you do now have the option to ask them to stay if they're in boxes, and based on their friendship level with you, they may refuse or oblige. Wild World strikes kind of a balance between giving the player more freedom and agency to mold the town into whatever they want it to be, and making villagers still feel like participants in the town with their own agency. Through weekly events such as Lottie Day, villagers could suggest new town tunes, and most of the other events like Yay Day are experienced only through interacting with villagers. A majority of the content in the game is villager-centric, designed to make the emergent events of daily life with your neighbors the main draw. Villagers will no longer bury things around town and leave messages on the bulletin board about it, but there are mysterious messages of the week left up that are presumably written anonymously by residents, and villagers will speculate on who wrote them. The main way villagers' presence is felt is still through the way they influence the flow of gameplay through their systems, and I think that keeps it from feeling too much like you have more say in town life than they do. The player is able to mold the town to look the way they'd like, but it's it still isn't really your town more than theirs. You might be in charge of beautification, but they're the main appeal of coming to play at all. Ultimately, Wild World makes it clear that the community is the bedrock of your town, and any changes you might make to the landscape are superficial. The one area where city folk is the most like Wild World is that it more or less replicates the expressive capabilities of the player verbatim, save for being able to more quickly change things like your hairstyle and being able to change the color of your shoes. The biggest difference is that the town layout now gives each player an individual house rather than all users on a single system being tied to one big mansion, which encourages a multitude of people to all express themselves and their will in the town at the same time. Higher definition graphics incentivize a better looking town, and higher quality patterns allow players to finally design clothes with unique sleeves, fronts, and backs, rather than having the same pattern pasted on each element. With the flow of gameplay altered to make it more difficult to earn enough money to take advantage of expressive elements and get your hands on furniture and clothing to impress your real life friends, you now often have to choose between spending time with your villagers and helping them out or using that time to grind for cash 
tracks instead. The animal tracks feature also encouraged players to create natural paths that would follow the player's most used routes throughout the town by running, much like paths appear in high traffic areas of grass in real life. However, this kind of backfired, as most players don't run specifically in the same path every time they go from place to place, and ultimately the more a person played, they would just end up with no grass at all. This became a much loathed feature, as it used the player's own agency against them. City folk towns are quite large with multiple levels, and not being able to run without making a big footprint on the appearance of your town was kind of a big drag. Thanks to the Wii Connect 24 feature, villagers can now move in and out of your town basically at any time, and the system of being able to ask them to stay was altered somewhat. Rather than just suddenly being in boxes like in Wild World, here villagers would ping the player and mention wanting to move out. The player then has the option to ask them to stay. If you miss this ping, however, villagers will end up packing up on their set move-out date, and thanks to the dialogue system, you won't get the option then of asking them to stay. Villagers retain most of their agency and ability to impact the town from Wild World as well. They can still plant flowers, and villager plots are tied to signpost locations, meaning they can move in on top of anything placed too close to a signpost. Holidays and events are still experienced mostly through interacting with villagers, and some villager-centric content remains. However, villagers will no longer use the bulletin board at all for any reason, and thanks to the change in interaction systems and decreased frequency of pings, they are a much less noticeable presence around town and it feels a lot less like a close-knit community. Wild World shifted the balance of power somewhat to give the player more agency, but bolstered villager interactions to compensate. City Folk just replicates that player power while toning down villager activity, and it starts to feel like a deterioration of that bedrock. This all changes dramatically with New Leaf, when you're named mayor instantly upon arriving in town, immediately changing the role you play in the town compared to the other inhabitants and placing you above them. You make all the decisions for the town. You not only have absolute say in how it looks through planning public works projects and planting trees, flowers, and shrubbery, you also make the rules through town ordinances. This was the first point in the series where you could turn off the effects of neglect if you didn't want to weed your carefully planned and executed plots every day. You had the power to curate every aspect of play to your preference. Flowers no longer wilted if they weren't watered so long as you set the right ordinance, and weeds no longer grew. If you wanted to make a lot of money without working hard at all, you could make the economy a priority. If you worked the graveyard shift in real life, you could keep the shops open later or have them open earlier, and even affect villagers' sleep schedules. There was no need to plan your real life around the game anymore. Everything was accessible to any player any day of the week. The idea of living a second life inside the game was more or less totally dismantled. Animal Crossing became a town builder first and a town sim second, with a huge emphasis on the player's will and expression. A huge part of the appeal and focus of the game was placed on creating the most impressive, most curated town. Every shrub, every tree, every flower, every hybrid, every pattern laid out and cultivated to say something about you, the mayor, and everything else was secondary. Players being able to design a multitude of types of patterns, from ground tiles to dresses to hats to wallpapers and flooring, and share them via QR codes meant that the power of laying great looking paths was no longer locked away behind needing to have any artistic ability or knowing people who did. One Google search will net you hundreds of QR codes from strangers just to click away. You are a public service representative now. The forest is your domain, and you are here to do the job of transforming the entire thing from plain and boring to perfectly customized and tailored to you. And while your agency, your power in the town is greatly increased, villagers' agency is greatly diminished. They can no longer move out of your town at all without express permission from you. And the Welcome to Amiibo update gives any player willing to shell out the dough the ability to handpick every resident and immediately kick out anyone they don't want. House placement is is no longer tied to signposts around town, which made it somewhat harder to predict where a villager would move in, but to compensate, villagers would now explicitly make an effort not to move in on top of paths or flowers if there were open spaces available, giving the players some control over where they would place their plots. Just about the only freedom that they didn't take away from villagers in favor of the player is the ability to plant their own flowers and water them. This dramatic change from the previous title signaled a shift in focus. They could have had a balance of expressive elements, online play, and single player. There's no reason animals having hobbies or personalities would have hurt the gameplay loop New Leaf or City Folk set out to accomplish, but the fact that this change persists across multiple titles in the series, and now the majority of Animal Crossing games in itself says volumes about what the game's goals are ultimately, and that this change was not an accident. All of your time, all of your daily tasks, became about making your town look the way you wanted it to, and villain villagers were your constituents, not your equals. New Horizons does away with any remaining obstacles that might have been in the way of giving the player absolute power over every aspect of the town. With terraforming, now even the earth itself bends to your will. All bridges and inclines are placed deliberately by you. All furniture and decoration is placed deliberately by you. 
The only creature in town who might have more power than you is Nook, and that's only because he's sitting behind a desk taking your money every time you want to place a new bridge you demonstrably could have built yourself at your crafting table. He also decides the arbitrary value of his own currency, Nook Miles, which seems like a freemium feature that Nintendo chickened out at the last second on monetizing. He and Isabel still do the daily announcements on your timetable. If the first time you play for the day is 2am, Isabel will still get on the microphone and wake up everyone in the town just to share the daily news for your benefit. Just about the only thing you can't do is move Town Hall for some reason. Because the town rating system is weighted heavily on large crafted items and densely packed items in every single available space in your town, the game expects you to put a lot of time into creating parks, restaurants, and little outdoor tableaus of stationary, non-interactable items to serve as photo opportunities for your Instagram. Ironically, though the player has more freedom than ever to express themselves creatively with all the various new tools and customization options, the rating system, combined with the limited catalog of items available in the game, incentivizes everyone to build basically all the exact same stuff and place it in the exact same way, as there's a pretty limited number of ways vending machines and outdoor stalls make sense, and the game so heavily requires these large items. The game has no real way to grade any creative terraforming, so if you spend a lot of time having fun making cliffs, valleys, waterfalls, and rivers and use up all your space on those things, you'll lose out on writing points for not prioritizing flat open space to place furniture. This also ironically involves pretty much deforesting your entire island, as you need a lot of space to keep building, and Isabel wants you to have a really limited number of trees on your island, all out of the way in neat little rows. Wasn't this game called Animal Forest? Any remaining agency villagers might have had at this point is entirely stripped away. They can no longer choose where their houses go at all. You choose that. And you can move them around at will, whenever you want, whatever time of day. They'll play out the theater of the villager agreeing to have their house moved, but there's never any question that you know better than them where they should live. Villagers can no longer plant their own flowers, they also can't catch any of the bugs or fish that they run around pantomiming that they're hunting. Heaven forbid they take some opportunity away from the player by consuming that bug into their own inventory. Mystery Island tours give the player additional means for controlling who moves into town beyond amiibos, and just about the only thing you can't manipulate on any real level without them is who wants to move out of your town. The only thing villagers can do to interrupt your absolute power is sit in your way while you're trying to lay a path or make a river. Villagers now are just cute little dolls that act as another perfect decoration in your perfect town. Their role is even more stripped down than your poles and Fire Emblem heroes. They function as some pretty artwork to look at and hunt for, but ultimately they don't feel like real characters or have a real role to play in town life. They're props. Their houses are little doll houses with little perfect doll furniture inside. There's actually a rarity tier built into who you'll run into to on mystery islands that has the relatively visually uninteresting villagers and unpopular species like farm animals at the very bottom. Your first five villagers when you're doing the story for the first time and unlocking everything are set pre-picked by the game to basically guarantee that you're going to spend most of your time playing trying to replace half your island. Villagers vacate their lots very infrequently without the use of amiibo cards, and lots are basically guaranteed to autofill the following day thanks to the player's villager void filling up every time they travel to another person's island. This means that without paying for cards, the average player will have basically one single day a month that they get a free opportunity for a new villager, which also means that players are guaranteed to sink all their nook miles into tickets for a single day worth of island grinding. Additionally, this rarity tier makes getting the villager that you want for free not impossible, but so frustrating and unfair feeling that it creates this perfect storm of desperation. Players won't feel like they're being held hostage by a system designed to take their money, but are still motivated to drop money on cards so that they won't feel like the time they spent hunting the freeway was a sunk cost. If you waste an entire day hunting for your dreamy and don't get it, that $40 to $50 on Amazon for their amiibo card starts to sound more reasonable. The campsite gives the player another free chance at a villager, but walls off the ability to choose who you kick out of town behind paying for cards. So this isn't simply gotcha adjacent, this is a full-on gotcha mechanic, right down to the gotcha specific in-game currency. When you make a game primarily about giving the player control over everything, but then work in a bunch of elements that the player has no control over unless they spend more money, this is how villagers become commodities first and people second. These villagers might as well be collectible stamps and the ones no one wants are common draws. Over time, it seems clear that a deliberate decision to decrease the villagers' roles in gameplay, agency, and ability to interact with the player has been implemented into the design of Animal Crossing games. Villagers are almost vestigial at this point, a holdover from when the series had a unique identity and charm and was still at its core a life simulation game with role-playing elements. The shift in focus over time to favor elements with wider and wider appeal meant that any personality villagers had must be ironed out to please as many people as possible all at once. You can't broaden the player base and expect all players to be 
okay with things like cranky and snooty villagers being outright mean or hostile. Supposedly, Mr. Resetti's role was changed in New Leaf because he made little kids cry in the older games by being too scary. So considering that, it's not too surprising that the rest of the cast also now act like they're permanently on Xanax. An appeal to expressive elements over role-playing also helped expand the audience beyond the niche and into the mainstream, to help Animal Crossing go from beloved cult classic to competing with juggernauts like Minecraft. The sad thing is that in games like Wild World, they pretty deftly wove online play and single-player interactions with villagers together. Even with some decent expressive elements in online play, the developers chose to give villagers a greatly increased role and integrate that role with the other mechanics. One of the most common interactions for getting pinged in Wild World was your villagers showing off letters that your friends wrote to them while they were visiting or if they moved in from another town, letting them into their history with your friends. This, along with a plethora of other online-specific villager interactions and functions, gave players a social incentive to write mail to and interact with the villagers in other people's towns. Rather than having the close virtual friendships with your villagers be something separate from your relationship with your real-life friends, they pretty neatly entwined the two together, creating life that existed inside the DS and out. So if they can pretty clearly make both work, why choose to have one over the other? I've seen speculation that originally, they changed villager dialogue and city folk and discouraged interaction in order to make the game more accessible to people who couldn't read, namely younger children. I can see this being true for city folk alone, but villagers still have decreased presence all the way up to New Horizons, a game with a ridiculous amount of dialogue. Instead, I think there's something else going on. Nintendo is a toy company at heart, and I think the gotcha model appeals to them. Having so many blank slate cute little characters for players of all ages to project whatever they want onto makes for a more desirable product to get whales to sink oodles and oodles of cash into than if the villagers themselves had a larger role in the gameplay. It's the Beanie Baby craze of the 90s reincarnate, and to make that happen, the villagers have to have about the same amount of personality as one. Gotcha game characters don't have to be blank slates necessarily, but consider who they're appealing to and the otherwise expressive content of the game. It's really hard to find specific demographic information about who plays Animal Crossing, because Nintendo typically doesn't talk about or release that kind of information about most of their games. However, I did find this one article I'll link below that states that although 69% of the 3DS user base at the time of its release were men, 56% of the 3DS and New Leaf bundle sales were to women aged 19 to 24. This means that a majority of sales of a game and system typically dominated by young men went to women for this particular title. And that gives us some idea of what ratio of Animal Crossing players must be women not even accounting for other age groups. This, when corroborated with the general experience of most social media posts about New Leaf and New Horizons coming from young women, makes it seem likely that some majority of players, if not a large majority, are female. This is just hearsay as there's basically no data to back up this information, but a large part of the active online Animal Crossing community also tends to be young and LGBT. Now, not to make generalizations, but generally, when you look at online fandoms of media aimed at similar demographics, you tend to find that the more popular characters tend to be really visually interesting, but with not a lot of defined character traits to inform who they are. Characters who get the most fan art, fan fiction, fanships, and so on. These characters tend to spark the collective imagination of their fans and act as an attractive framework for young creatives to build on with their own personal vision for the character. In this context, having less personality is a plus. Considering that Animal Crossing in its later iterations is already a space for imaginative young people to express themselves, it's not surprising that there's a lot of overlap in these communities, and that these sorts of characters might be more desirable for the active imagination of the online fanbase. This is why you see a lot of content online surrounding Raymond overlapping in themes present in the infamous Funsler Tumblr fandom. So basically, Nintendo is making a gotcha aimed at teen girls, and we are all along for the ride. Distilling their presence down to cute tradable collectibles may not have been the goal when they originally started toning down villager presence in City Folk, but it certainly must have been in their minds from New leaf on. They were playing the long con. Amiibo Festival was just a quick cash-in on an idea that was going to take years to fully see through. Even if these elements aren't monetized directly by in-game microtransactions, the fact that some Amiibo cards run ridiculously high in the second-hand market proves that their whales are out there. Whether or how they choose to cash in further, I guess we'll see. In some markets, Amiibo cards are getting a second run release, which shows that they're well aware of the demand that they've created and intend to capitalize on it. Their insistence on physical media in place of digital transactions, though, is going to make it hard in this present global climate to reach as many people who'd be willing to pay. So it won't surprise me if for the next game, or even later on in an update to New Horizons, we start seeing an in-game payment system for villagers. Nook Miles certainly feel like a proof of concept for that, but it is Nintendo, so it also won't surprise me if they dig 
in their heels and keep finding ways to turn their microtransactions into toys. It does help them slip past the gambling laws that block gotchas in many European countries to have players buy packs of cards rather than playing virtual roulette. Whatever the case, it seems clear that villagers having a major role in Animal Crossing as a single player game is a design element that we won't see making a return. As social features and focus on aesthetics take an ever increasing front seat, and making boatloads of cash off of trading cards is still Nintendo's number one goal. Don't come crying to me when at the start of quarter four Nintendo releases a new limited edition holiday Raymond with red tipped ears and an elf flavored maid outfit.